Hello, everyone. My name is Jonathan Everett. I'll be talking to everyone today about the wide world of consent. Now, the reason the talk is called this is because I was told let's talk about consent will be needlessly inflammatory, and so we went with this name instead. Just a little bit of a background about who I am. Um, I was born in Joburg, and I went to Parktown Boys in Joburg. Then I promptly went to the ocean and studied at UCT. Um, while I studied at UCT, I made myself many promises to not leave the ocean, um, to not go back and live in Joburg, until I got a job offer in Joburg and then went straight back to Joburg, um, where I'm currently a cybersecurity consultant at MWR CyberSec, and I'm lead of the application, uh, web application service. Um, and then just a side note, I'm an ocean enthusiast stuck in a landlocked city. <laughs> It does make my hobbies a lot harder than I'd like it to be. Um, scuba diving in dams isn't the same as surfing. <laughs> cool, um, so just a recap for anyone who's not very familiar with fishing. Um, in the beginning, there were two types of fishing and most people are actually very familiar with this even if they don't know it by name. But the first one is credential phishing, right? So a trustworthy stranger on the internet. The reason they're trustworthy is because they're on the internet and everyone on the internet is trusted. Um, but they say here is a link to safebark.com. Uh, please log in and use your credentials and then do whatever you need to do. Then they skim your credentials and they log in and make payments on your behalf. Um, the second one is payload phishing, right? And not another trusted stranger. We trust them because they're on the internet. Hey, please download my malware or sorry, my save files from savefiles.com um, and just to make sure there's no authorization problems, run it as an administrator. Um, and you do that and then they have a really good Christmas and you don't have the best one. And now there's consent phishing, right? So now we're a little bit more wizened and we don't trust strangers as easily. We know our endpoints that we trust, um, endpoints like Microsoft Online. So here's a stranger saying, hi, please give access to my, give my application access to your email inbox. Um, there's a lot of trustworthy stranger spam going on and I want to clean that up so you don't get fished or anything like that. Um, you're going to a legitimate Microsoft endpoint and just give me the access I need to, um, to clean up your email inbox. Um, and then once again, you get fished for a third time and you just give up on the internet. <laughs> so the short of it is, um, the short of consent phishing is a malicious application makes a request to an identity provider to have spe specific permissions granted over a user's account. The user then consents to these permissions for the application, which allows the application to perform actions on behalf of the user within the restrictions of the scope of consent. Um, a couple important things here, an identity provider is a trusted third party, and for the purposes of this talk, we are going to be using Microsoft and Azure. Um, and on that note, I do know Azure AD became Entra ID, but it was Azure AD for far longer than it's been Entra ID, so if I say Azure AD, just think I'm saying Entra ID. Um, and we'll look at all of these different points as the talk goes along, and you'll understand um, why I phrased it like this, right? So just a couple basics here for OAuth. So OAuth 2.0 is a very useful protocol, um, but it's used for authorization. OpenID is used for authentication, and obviously we all know that authorization is distinct from authentication, where authentication is the process of proving your identity, and authorization is the process of associating privileges to someone who has proven their identity. Um, so here we just have a, I'm suddenly getting louder, um, here we just have a quick diagram as to what it looks like um, for, from the user's perspective on this kind of flow, just so that we are all um, on the same page here. So pretty much you go to a web application, the web application says, hey, I need access to your account on Microsoft, so they redirect you to a legitimate Microsoft-owned domain, microsoftonline.com. Um, and it's very important to note that this is your legitimate Microsoft login page. I'm not gonna show you the Microsoft login page, I think we've all seen it. Um, but once you get there, um, you log in if you don't have an active session, and then you get a consent prompt, which you saw earlier and you'll see later again, um, saying will you give the following permissions to this application that it's requesting over your account. If you give those permissions, you will be redirected back to that application with a code. The application, the backend, can then take that code and get back an access token um, to perform actions on, on your behalf. It's very important to note it's getting an access token here. Reason is very important is because it's not getting anything like a session. Um, it's not something that you can revoke. It's not something that password change will um, invalidate because imagine if every time you change your password, you broke all of the integrations you had with your apps. 
So this is, um, and I will keep stressing this, this is legitimate functionality. This is working legitimate functionality. And attackers are doing what they love to do best. They take very useful legitimate functionality and they use it in illegitimate ways to have a really good Christmas. Um, and so when does this become consent, right? So scopes are requests for privileges. If I want to read your email, I'm going to go for the mail.read scope. When a user says the application can perform those actions, that is the user giving consent, right? So this is good. As I said, the OAuth framework is a legitimate framework. It is very useful, and it's much better to have it than not to have it, right? So some of the really good things we get out of it is we allow granular control of permissions over our accounts to be given out to third-party applications. Now, it's better to only give me access to reading your emails than giving me admin control over your entire account. But, I mean, if you want to, you're welcome to give me that admin control. I'll send you an email address you can send the creds to. Um, and the second one is you don't have to disclose your credentials, right? You're giving access to third-party applications giving them control over your account and you're not giving them your credentials because even though everyone in this room definitely uses a different password for every web application they have, not everyone does that. Anyway, so how do I get consent, right? Um, you ask, that's what you really need to do. But um, from a technical perspective, uh, we need our malicious application. So what I have here is a trustworthy domain um, with DNS to an EC2 instance. I'm not gonna go through all of that. Um, there's a bunch of tutorials online. Um, and then I registered an application in Azure, right? Remember Microsoft, we're focusing on Azure. Um, and then if you look on the right, yeah, you can see that. I'm asking over here for a multi-tenant multi or multi-organizational um, application so I can fish other people. Um, and then just my redirect URI is um, back to my attacker control domain, uh, trustworthy domain.lol. And then on that note, when you get here, something I forgot to mention is obviously you need to get a secret, right? You get a secret like a basically a password um, so you can prove your identity when requesting the access token. Then once you have everything set up, um, you get a page like you see over there um, with an application ID, your tenant ID, all of that stuff. All of that stuff is public information, so it's fine for me to show you guys um, because the application ID, you can see on the right, it goes into the link um, that you use for the consent grant, right? So if you think about it, every single application that's registered in Azure needs their own unique endpoint. So it's not doing a different domain URL path for each application, it's passing a different parameter and that parameter is your application ID, so it is public. And then just in this link, you can see what you need here is your application ID and then the scopes you're requesting. Um, the code here is the type of OAuth flow we're going through. There is a bunch more than what I'm doing today. It is too much to do in 45 minutes. Um, yeah. And then you get the users to click on your link, right? Much easier, it's a Microsoft link. So please, friend, click on my link. Um, you will be rich, I promise, right? Classic internet scam. <laughs> oh, wrong one. Yes, um, and then we get over here, we get to the consent prompt. So I could have expanded each of these ones that you see over here. However, this is the default consent prompt that you would see. Now, important thing, you have a really nice Microsoft badge at the top. That makes phishing a lot easier. Um, but you see my trustworthy application is unverified. We'll talk about that more later. Basically, it means I'm not a partner of Microsoft. I haven't joined their cloud partner program. Um, and then the application may be risky for the same reason. Also, I'm asking for consent to, um, to create users in their tenant. Um, so it is actually a risky application. Um, yeah, so there's some interesting points here, right? So not anyone can grant um, consent to any scope. That would be a bad idea, right? Imagine if your normal users could grant full control over your Azure tenant. Um, I wish all security teams luck with that scenario. <laughs> um, but some privileges need administrator approval, and administrator approval can only be granted by a global admin or a privileged role admin. It's important to note that every scope that requires administrative approval has to go through these guys. There aren't tiers to administrative approval, it's this or nothing. And there are a lot of scopes, um, several hundred, so just check out the Microsoft um, permissions if you are interested in it. 
Um, and because the demo I am doing is going to be with an administrator scope, I don't want everyone just to focus on those scopes because, I mean, it is the most fun to be an admin, right? If you gain admin access to a system, that's when you have the best time. But that doesn't mean admins are the only people that matter. So here are some fun scopes that I saw that a threat actor may want to look into. Um, and then we'll, when performing a consent phishing attack, right? So online meetings read write. Uh, just consider if an attacker had to watch all the meetings you've taken part in. Firstly, you'd feel sorry for them because there's a lot of meetings. Um, but just think about what information is discussed there and what information they could gain access to. People dot read, so just read all the contacts of a user. Um, get legitimate emails to fish against, infer internal relationships, all of that stuff uh, can be very useful. Mail read write shared, uh, CRUD operations on your mailbox and shared mailboxes. Um, then mail send shared if you don't want to go for the read write. Um, sending mail just makes phishing then easier because you have an internal mailbox that you can then fish from. User read basic all, so this is read basic information for all users. Um, and then analytics.read for those um, internet based um, corporations who really want to sell our data, um, they can ask for our consent this time before they sell it. Um, but I would say the rule of thumb for granting consent is if you have full control over the, the resource that you're granting consent for, um, you can likely grant that con consent. If you don't have full control, you most likely need administrator approval. If there's something that's kind of split between you and a different role, that's probably going to require administrator approval, even if both roles aren't admins. Right? So once we make that request, once the consent prompt has happened, we get back the code um, at which we can then trade to Microsoft um, using this piece of code here to get a nice um, access token. Now, a couple important things here that we'll see later is that what I'm using here is a conf confidential client application. Basically, what that means is I'm using a secret to get a code back, and you'll see why that's interesting a little bit later. And then I get my access token back, and with that access token, I can start profiting. Um, and we can use that access token to perform other actions. Remember, this is legitimate functionality I just explained to you. None of this is tooling or anything like that. The way I started doing this was I googled, how do developers um, integrate with Azure? And then that's where I started. Um, and we just have a little demo so we can see how it actually goes. If it plays, it's playing. Yeah, so you can see I just generated myself an endpoint. Um, it's a lot easier to fish yourself, so I pasted that into um, Firefox. Sorry, I forgot my browser. And you can see the logs for my web servers over here. Right now I'm logging in as Jay Fredrickson. Side note, um, Jay Fredrickson's not Jono, it's James Fredrickson. Um, a lot of people seem to confuse that one. Uh, here's the consent prompt here. I am asking for administrator approval, so I do have to consent on behalf of my organization. This is the only time someone else can grant consent for you. Um, and here I get the code back, which is also in the logs you can see at the bottom left, bottom left. Um, once I take that code and I put it into my very secure um, Python script that definitely doesn't have a password in it. You'll see it now. There you go. Um, the password has been deleted. Don't use it. But if you do remember it, uh, well done. Um, I take a while to type because I didn't plan well enough for this demo. Um, and then we run the code. And basically what we'll get back is we'll get a scope back. Uh, and we'll get specifically the scopes we asked for back. Now, I want to bring everyone's attention back to what I said at the beginning. You perform actions within the restrictions of the scope you requested for. So I requested for directory read write all, which allows me to write new users to the directory, but it doesn't necessarily allow me to assign roles to those users. So you'll see now when I create a user with my Python script, um, if I type faster, then um, when I create that user, you, we're going to get an error on the second one. The reason for that error is because the role assignment failed, but I'll still be able to log into the user and um, log, log in as that user. Um, so a good thing, Microsoft does actually implement authorization to some degree. <laughs> Sorry, it's a good time for me to take a drink. Um, I almost feel like theme music should go while I have these going. <laughs> I'm not singing for the crowd though, that would not be fun for anyone. And, but basically what we see here is the user I created, 
um, a trusted friend. This is the easiest way to make friends. I can confirm that. Um, I'm now logging in as that user onto the tenant that I just created, um, but they don't have a role associated with them, and because it's the first time I'm logging on as them, I do have to reset their passwords. I made it secure, I promise. That's not the password either. <laughs> cool. Um, so a story of the logs. What do the logs tell us? Do we get all the logical information? Okay, I could have gone with more groans, but you know, we try. <laughs> I promise there's at least one more pun in my slides. Um, so, yeah, we see the main logs in a whole bunch of different places, um, and they're listed there. Basically, anywhere where there's audit logs for any party involved, um, you can see them. So, the logs are, you see above, basically, I granted consent to an application, that's really great. Then, if you expand them, you actually get the useful information about who granted consent to what scope. So, these logs are good. And I'm going through them quickly because they are good. You have everything you need in them. However, when we do stuff such as create a user, the logs get a bit worse. Um, so you can see here that my application did perform some actions. It created a user, but then when I assigned a role to that user, and this is a different set of logs because the role assignment actually worked, um, it actually defaults back to the global administrator who gave approval to the application if you do it outside of privileged identity management which I guarantee you right now, if you, a SOC sees that, they are rabbit-holing on the global admin, not the um, malicious application. So there are some misleading logs in these, um, and they can be hard to deal with, but if you know that this is actually what happened and you expand those logs, you look into them, you can tie back that story, it just does become a lot harder, <clears throat> especially when the email you get says the user administrator um, was assigned to the, comp the malicious user by the global admin, not by the application. So a couple uh, red herrings that you'd have to deal with, which is why it's important to know that these are some of the niche cases people have to deal with. Um, but yeah, so the logs are mostly there for this type of consent phishing, which is good to know. Um, and we can fix it. Not really. Um, not realistically, not in big organizations. Uh, the easiest way is you only allow admins to review consent. However, if you have thousands of employees, that's thousands of consent requests they may have to review. It's not really realistic. So the bet a better defense, as always, for phishing is user awareness. What most people will end up using is the middle one. It will allow um, consent to verified applications and unverified applications within your own tenant. That way, if one of your users gets phished from an unverified application, you've already been compromised. So that's at least not the entry factor. And then the one you shouldn't use is the one at the bottom, which is the one I did use, which is allow anyone to consent to anything. Then, as I said, you can join the Microsoft partner, Cloud Partner Program, and you can go from being an unverified, trustworthy application to having a nice blue tick. That just makes everything a lot easier. I haven't looked into how hard this is to do. I imagine with Microsoft, it's a lot of documentation and is not, quite, is not fun. Um, it's easier for threat actors to actually just compromise people who have access to that. You just need your tenant to be verified itself, and you need to have the ID of the partner you verified against um, when you create the application, and then it becomes verified. And then the most important one for all types of phishing is user knowledge, right? Reading consent prompts, knowing this exists, and knowing this could be bad, and also knowing what to do when they make a mistake. We all make mistakes, and we all mess up all the time, for me at least. Um, so when you make a mistake, it's important that they know who to go to and who to talk to so that they can um, sort out the issue. Right, so more practical uses for these kinds of attacks explained in the theoretical context. So the obvious use, use case here that I'm gonna go over quite quickly is just external phishing. We have an unverified application that we're trying to phish into a company with, um, and we have the specific scopes we want to use to get in. It's the most basic version of consent phishing. Um, and it's the easiest to do as well. If you want to actually have a verified application, don't go through that whole process of signing up to Microsoft and all that stuff. Now, I'm not saying you should do this, but if I was the threat actor, I'd just compromise someone who's verified and use their tenant to fish in. You can also use third-party trust, making phishing a lot easier. Because unfortunately we, just don't, unfortunately, we just don't trust strangers on the internet anymore. It's not like it used to be. Um, and then now we have a nice, very complicated attack scenario that I enjoy using, right? So you've, at this point, compromised a web application. Web application was vulnerable to SQL injection, RCE, whatever you want it to be. You're sitting in the DMZ. The DMZ is well created, so you can't actually get into their corporate environment. 
Um, but on the DMZ, you're using an application that has um, a registration within Azure. You don't have access to Azure at this point, but there is an interesting thing Microsoft lets you do. You can add arbitrary scopes to the um, endpoint that you go to the consent prompts with, and that you don't register those scopes anywhere. So what you can do, because you're sitting on the web app that receives the code back, which would also have the secret on it, is you can add arbitrary scopes to the link, and if you can get internal users to click that link, or external users who use this application, you can then gain whatever scopes those are. You can request the JWT as this application, and you can use it as a stepping stone from a DMZ compromise into the Azure Cloud Network if you can't get onto the corporate network. Um, so, and to be honest, this isn't really something they can fix easily, apart from having you assign the scopes to an application registration when you create it. I imagine that can get tricky with specific apps that have a lot of different functionality to associated with them. Um, but it's a nice pivot from a DMZ onto a cloud environment when you're stuck on a red team engagement. But, and this is the new part, so I did talk about this at Hexcon this year, and I did speed up that first half um, so that we can get to this part now. What if we could get admin scopes without admin consent, right? That would be dumb, and Microsoft would never do something like that. Well, rather than make our own application, which is hard, then we have to get people to trust us, we have to think of really good names, which is actually one of the hardest parts of this, coming up with really good names for demos. The trustworthy domain took me a while. Um, what if we just impersonated an application? What if we took a legitimate application that's done all that hard work for us, and we just impersonated that instead? Say, for example, oh, not that slide. Um, before I tell you what that was, um, as you can see, I switched the slides around in my head, I'm going to give you guys some more background. So do you remember how I said confidential client application is an important thing to note? So that's one of the flows we can go through. That's more secure. It has a password. That exists for applications where the client side or the side that's not requesting the JWT um, is on a server that is controlled by a company. It's trusted. The public flow is the other flow. That's when the application requesting the JWT is on a server not controlled by your company. It's client side, so it has to be untrusted, right? So what is untrusted? Well, mobile applications are, untrust are untrusted. In, in AppSec, we say everything client side is untrusted. Desktop apps, apps are untrusted, and browserless APIs are untrusted. Um, so all of these have to use the public, um, public, public client flow Sorry, it's a tongue twister there, um, rather than the confidential flow. And that is correct. Um, this is actually correct, and I fully agree with this. This is in the OAuth 2.0 spec. Um, you can't have a password on the client side because the client side is untrusted, and any password you have there can eventually be compromised by an attacker. So this is the correct way of doing this, and once again, we are using legitimate functionality, and we're just using it for illegitimate means. So the application I started to target, and because we're, my, we're targeting Microsoft here, um, it's a desktop and a mobile application um, that has to authenticate, so it is Office 365, because I thought, if I'm not a CEO yet, I may as well use, learn how to use Excel and PowerPoint. <laughs> um, so this is a perfect one to target. Obviously, it has to flow the, follow the public um, client flow because it's hard to keep saying that, but because it's uh, client side and it cannot be trusted. So this is correct. They did it correctly, but then they let you do it yourself. So the flow, okay, you can read that better than I can. So the flow we're going to follow here is you make a request to Microsoft saying, I want to onboard a mobile device, right? Microsoft says, sure thing, if you want to onboard a mobile device, here's a unique code. Put this code into the device login endpoint um, and then just confirm it's you, so you have to log in and go through MFA and all of that stuff. And then once you confirm it's you, then they're like, that's great, here's the JWT, right? Notice how there's no secret being involved here, there's no verification, um, and that's because there can't be. Because we can't have a secret because it's a client-side application. And then once you get that JWT, you can go and profit. Um, so here is another demo of, here we go, of a script that I kind of, wrote, manipulated, made to do what I wanted it to do. Um, I will be releasing this in the next couple of weeks. But basically, 
we go to the device logon endpoint here. We take the code that was given to us by Microsoft. We pass it to that endpoint and we log in as the J Fredrickson user. Now we can see here, can I pause this? I can pause this. This is very important, right? Are you trying to sign into Microsoft Office? Yes, I am. And if I'm IT and I call up a user and I say, hey, your Microsoft Office, does it feel slow to you? Or is your Wi-Fi feeling a bit slow today? It's always feeling slow to users. So they'll say yes and we can fix it this way. And then when I press play, we continue because we're trying to sign into Microsoft Office. Thank you for signing in. And you'll see on the left a full JWT comes out. I was uh, polling in the background Microsoft to get that JWT. And then we pop that into JWT.io. This isn't really client confidential, so I can put it there. <laughs> um, I did consider not putting this part in just because I thought I'd get some flack for it. But we, we get some really interesting scopes here. Um, okay, it's easier to read here. Um, so here we can see all the scopes I have listed. Um, and on the next slide, we can actually see them easily. So these are all the scopes we get, and these are all the admin scopes we get. Every scope on the right, um, got to check left, right, um, requires admin, admin approval, right? So you got really, really bad sco scopes to get, like directory read all, files read all. But all of these scopes make sense for Office to have, right? Office needs to be able to read your files. It needs to be able to read your emails. It needs to write to them as well. And this looks really bad, and I'm trying to make it look very bad, um, but it's actually not as bad as it seems. It's still bad. Um, you're not all powerful, right? You can do what Microsoft Office does, but Microsoft Office can't do everything. It can't create users, for example. So even though you have access to specific scopes, Office itself is not authorized to perform API calls on those scopes. So you do need to plot out a path of functionality that Microsoft Office can use um, to further compromise the tenant you're targeting. However, you can do what Microsoft Office can do, which is a lot, right? It's got Excel, it's got PowerPoint, it's got Word, and those are three, three applications that have file formats with macros that you can then change to suit your own personal needs. So it's a give and a take, right? They have to use the public client authentication flow um, because this is to spec, but it does allow a more attack surface um, here. One note that I forgot to mention when going through that flow is the code's only valid for 15 minutes. It does make social engineering harder because we will have to talk to people, which I know none of us like to do. Um, but rather than sending an email and hoping that they're going to get back to you within 15 minutes, most likely you have to be there physically or you have to give them a nice phone call. Um, and then you say, hi, your IT team said you have word problems. Um, but in those 15 minutes, you can gain access to some very important scopes. The biggest difference, I would say, using this versus using the first attack that I, I showed the team um, is the fact that you can control shared files, right? And the reason that's important is because remember how I said Microsoft does authorization? They do it and they do it properly. So you can't grant permission over other people's files. You can't grant control over that with your consent, even if you have control over it, because you don't own the file. If you're Office, you can grant control over it if you have that level of privileges, even if it's owned by someone else, because Office can do that. It has that functionality and it can perform those actions. So it's very useful based on your attack path to know that this exists and to know that you can use it or abuse it. Right, so now we have another story of the logs, right? I wouldn't make the same joke twice. Um, <laughs> sorry, I think I'm funny as well. Um, <laughs> so do we get useful logs? No, that's, that's what we get. That's it, we get a log on because you're logging on. That's all we have, right? The indicators of compromise you may have here as a SOC is IP address and location. It says you logged on, it says you logged on as a user who logged on, and you logged on to Microsoft, on to Microsoft 365. It's exactly what we did, it's legitimate functionality. It is impossible to point this as a um, cause of in entry point of compromise into a tenant, because if the attacker is smart, and your users say work from home and go to coffee shops, you're never really gonna know if this is them at a coffee shop or if this is the attacker. So there aren't logs for this one. And it's really difficult to actually get through. Um, I don't have a solution for this. I was shocked when there was only one log. Um, it's not great, 
but also this is hard fishing to do. Um, and that's why it's really important to have user awareness for these kinds of things, to know that they shouldn't just randomly log into Microsoft endpoints. Um, and when someone calls them and says, hey, I'm IT to fix Office, please just verify that it is actually IT. Um, and is there a fix? No, not really. There's not one either. This is legitimate Microsoft functionality. This is how you log on to Word. Um, in a hybrid cloud environment, you can't fix it because you have to have on-prem stuff. And if you want your users to have downloaded Word on their computer, you can't fix it because Microsoft won't trust client-side computers because they shouldn't. Um, and if, even if you are in a full cloud environment, you'd have to fully ban authenticating to Word from physical devices for that to work. Now, I really want you to sell that to C-Suite, and I really want you to sell that with me there, telling them they can't download Word or Excel um, and can't really do the work they need to do like that, especially because online um, Microsoft Office is not as good as downloaded, at least in my opinion. Um, yeah, so basically there isn't really a remediation either. So, I mean, it's not good news now. <laughs> But how does this compare? Well, the social engineering is a bit harder than the initial attack is because you have a time limit. Um, what I would do if I was a black hat hacker is I would start a repartee with my, with my friend, um, maybe he's in marketing, and I'd email back and forth for a bit, and then I would call them and be like, hey, can you put this code in? And then I would fish them like that um, because that's just easier to get them to do it. Uh, code, cold calling people doesn't sound particularly fun or easy. Um, also, I'm just trying to limit how much I talk to other people. Um, and if successful, this attack is extremely difficult to detect, especially if you're in the same region. However, you're limited. You can't just use this, use this attack to go and pwn their entire Azure environment. You can perform actions in the restrictions of the Microsoft Office 365 um, permissions, right? So even though you have the scopes, you can't perform all those actions. So this only becomes really bad is if you have an attack path you think or you know will work using Microsoft Office functionality. Now, that's not impossible. Say, for example, people use Excel documents that they download off the internet with macros enabled on them. They click past mark of the web and then you've got that working. It's still hard, right? You still have to get there. You still have to find those documents. You still have to change the macros. You still have to get them to download it again. And people who use those documents don't always like downloading them all the time and click through a consent prompt. It's really hard fishing. But it's important to know that this is there, right? And this is in spec as well. This is how you're meant to be doing it. It's just not every spec can cater for security as well as um, other specs can, right? You can't hold a password client side because that will eventually get compromised. We have a talk a bit later by Connor, who is really good at just breaking mobile apps, because that's his job. <laughs> so if you want to know more about why not to hold passes client-side with that, I would recommend talking to him. Um, so does this make the world burn? Not, no, not this. Other reasons the world's burning, but not this one. Um, consent phishing exists. It's important to know it exists. It can be exploited. It has been exploited in the wild against companies. Um, and it can be bad because it's like any other type of phishing. It's not necessarily going to easily give you network access to their on-prem servers, but with every company moving into the cloud, I do think that this is likely to be on the rise in the future. But the important thing to note for consent phishing, and the thing that really matters to me for defense here, is one, user awareness, um, knowing applications can be malicious, but two, is the verified badge we saw. Now, Microsoft isn't the best example of this because they just have a nice little blue tick saying you're verified or unverified. Um, but warning users when an application may be, di may be risky or dangerous is very important. Google has a full page that says, don't trust this application, which is very hard to actually fish through. So that kind of balance between that verification and that checking of an application to make sure that it is or isn't verified, and is or isn't trustworthy, is really where the defenses for consent phishing, for me at least, come in, um, on top of the more technical defenses, right? So not allowing anyone to consent to anything, um, allowing some people to consent to verify things. Yeah. Uh, so the world is burning, no, um, but this it does exist and it can be exploited and is be ex exploited. So it's worthwhile to keep this in mind when you're on a red team engagement and when you're teaching your users about phishing. Does anyone have any questions? Did I explain this? Oh, damn, I was going to explain it perfectly. Go for it. Uh, the first one, no. The second one, I don't know. <laughs> 
I've tested the second one against production tenants for companies, and it's worked fine every time. Yeah. The first one I haven't. Yeah. I'll look into it, yeah. Anyone else? Matty. No, the code is valid for 15 minutes. So when you make the request to Microsoft, you have to get them to input that code within 15 minutes. Okay. And once you've got your session, it's a normal? Then it's normal, yeah. Anyone else? Three, two, one. And we're done. Cool. Thanks, everyone.